Hello, podcast listeners. We know podcasts are a great way to catch up on a program that you may have missed on KSJE, and it's provided as a free service of this radio station. But you know, KSJE is now listener supported, and so while you enjoy this podcast, we hope that you'll also take some time to join KSJE. You become a member today. It's quite easy to do. Just go to our website at ksje.com slash support and pick the level of support that best matches your budget. Thanks again for listening. Here's your podcast. Welcome back to Right on Four Corners. I am Delshree Gladden. I'm a journalist, editor, and USA Today bestselling author of over 30 published novels. And on this week's episode, I have Samuel Galbraith, and he's going to be talking about his debut book of poetry. Samuel, go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm Samuel Galbraith. I have put out my first book, Mismatched Perceptions. I'm currently in high school. I think you are the youngest person I've had on the show since I took over at uh, 16. That's really exciting to be able to feature some talent who is younger, because a lot of my guests tend to be retired. That's when a lot of people finally have time to put energy and time toward their writing. Yes. <laughs> so you're ahead of the curve when it comes to that. Good job. Thanks. I was interested in the note that you have on the back cover, and I'm going to read it real quick. It says, poetry is all about perception. These poems are often interpreted as dark, including themes of death and despair. What will your perception be? And I liked that you included that because poetry can be difficult for someone to read and know exactly what the intent or the purpose was. Poetry is not my field of expertise. I come from a fiction background and I'm back working in journalism right now, which are sometimes really hard to get my mindset to bounce between those two things. <laughs> and for me, poetry is one that I'm like, oh, gosh, like I need to learn how to read and work with poetry more. Um, not write. That is not my talent at all when it comes to writing. But I would like to better understand poetry and how to read it and interpret it well. So I wondered with that note on the back, is that something that you've come across and had a hard time with people maybe reading differently into your poetry than what you intended or taking something different that you're like, well, hold on. <laughs> That's not necessarily what I was talking about. Because in working with young students, that seems to be a common struggle for them. Adults in my life don't understand what I'm writing about. Yeah, I think I've definitely come across people having different ideas about my poetry. Like, I can read my poetry to my friends, and they think it's totally something different than what I had intended. And truly, I think that's beautiful, is that um, everyone can take value from poetry, even if it's not what the author had intended. And I think that's kind of true for all writing, but especially for poetry. Yeah, I think the, the pared-down style of poetry where every word matters. In fiction, you have a little bit more room. I find journalism to be somewhere in the middle. You can't use a lot of extra words that you don't need. You literally have inches that you have to go by on how long your story can be. <laughs> that makes you think a little bit more about your word choice. I've done episodes lately with several different poets and them talking about how much they consider every single word that goes into it and they can spend time editing and it's two or three words each time that gets changed and really makes a difference in how they see the meaning coming through in those specific words. I find that really interesting. Like I said, I don't write poetry, but I think that's a really interesting process to focus so much on each individual word. And I wonder what that is like for you as a poet. You choose the word so specifically to get your meaning across. And then someone else is like, oh, yeah, this is what that means. You're like, eh, OK, not what I was going for. <laughs> What's that like in the process of sharing your work with people and how you work through that? When I edit my work, I tend to more edit for flow rather than meaning because I'm usually pretty happy with the meaning when I finish it the first time. But then I'll read it to someone and they have a get a different meaning. And I'm like, maybe I want to edit some of these words to get what I was meaning more across. But at the same time, I'm also happy with what they get from it as well. I think that is an interesting part of not only writing, but I think creative arts in general. 
that you can put something forward with a certain idea and people can take so many different meanings from it based on their own life experiences and what they see going into it. That's an interesting process, especially I've found that working with other writers as clients to see that develop throughout their project and as they start sharing that with other people. Because that's a scary part of being a creative person is sharing it with people. And a lot of people never quite reach that stage. They keep it to themselves. And it sounds like for you, that was something that was intimidating, that you had encouragement from friends and family. But putting your work out there for other people, that's a hard step to take. Definitely. I think the biggest reason why I decided to put my work out there was because other books have given meaning to me and helped me process my emotions and just made the world better for me. And I want to be able to do that for someone. So that's why I was like, you know, I'm just going to take that risk. I think being so young and seeing other people your age maybe struggling to find their voice to express themselves, that's something that I think a lot of teens especially struggle with. For someone else who might be having a hard time taking that step, what advice would you give them? I think just trying things. You may find something you like, you may find something you don't like, and that can be just as valuable as finding something you love. Just try. I had to try a bunch of different styles before I was like, yeah, this this fits me pretty well. And I'm still developing that style as well. I think that's a lifelong process (laughs) (laughs) with any form of art. But what were some of your influences or mentors, not necessarily the right word, um, because a lot of time with writing, it's it's not a a personal relationship that you build with the things that you you read. And sometimes, you know, those authors have been dead for a long time, but they can still have impact. So what were some of those influences for you that kind of steered you toward the style that you're working with now? I pretty much have all personal ones. I have a friend who is also a writer, and her writing style is very descriptive compared to mine, and that's something I strive to work on. Did you study in any of your classes at school? I took a creative writing class in my sophomore year. That was really fun. I got to try a bunch of different styles and just practiced writing every day. Seems like as as life gets crazier, you kind of have less room in your head for some of the creative pursuits and got to take that time intentionally to step away. Do you have a specific writing schedule or practice that you try to implement? Not really. School's a bit hectic right now, so I haven't had a chance to really implement one. But over the summer, I'm definitely planning to implement one and just write a little bit every day. That's what a lot of people find very effective. I'm not good at that particularly myself. That's always a frequently recommended tip. Set it aside sometime, write consistently. Maybe one day I'll get to that point. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Life will calm down eventually, right? <laughs> no, it never does. <laughs> Your process for putting this book together. What was that like? There's a lot more options in publishing now than there used to be. Tell me a little bit about that and how you brought this to be out in the world. Uh, So my family owns copyright printing up here in Farmington. And so I pretty much just went through them. They helped me figure out what it would look like, um, how we would print it, get the ISBN number and all of that. I don't know too much about them because I kind of just left that to them. You get the people who know what they're doing to help you with those processes. (laughs) They saw that that's who it was printed through. And do you plan to eventually put this in like ebook form or offer it through some of the more traditional outlets as well? Possibly. It's a bit undecided right now, to be honest. That's a very individual process to go through and figure out. One of the other things I wanted to ask you about with the overall production of the book, I love the illustrations in it. They're cute in a lot of them, but they're also, there's a lot of depth in some of the poems where you are discussing some darker topics, like that's reflected very very well in the illustration. So tell me about that process of having the illustrations done and illustrated by Karen Lesher and how you were able to pair those up. So I came up with the illustrations of what they would be. 
and I wrote them out for my grandma, who's Karen Lesher, and she really made them come to life. She did say I tended to make them too detailed to give a paragraph for every single illustration, <laughs> but I had that image in my head of what I wanted, and she made it come to life so wonderfully. That's a hard thing to visualize. I think always what you're putting down and being able to translate that to someone else. I have a good friend and she's been on the show recently, Summer Macon. She's a professional illustrator and we talked about her process working through an agent with different publishers and how that goes. And so it's interesting to see other people's processes who don't do it through the traditional route. It is hard to <laughs> yeah. communicate that to someone else. Even though it was, you know, your grandma and you sound like you have a close relationship with her. Getting like, this is what I'm picturing. Did that usually come through from what you described to her? And she was able to translate that into the images pretty well for the most part. For the most part, in the beginning, there was a little bit of, oh, let's change this. Um, but as we worked together more, we were able to find like, this is what I want. And then she made it happen. I'm glad you were able to have someone in your circle who was able to help you with that, because that can be a really difficult thing to find otherwise. Yes. <laughs> As I mentioned in your note on the back, you said that there are some darker themes, but that you were interested in what people's perception of that was and how people read into that. I remember one class that I was teaching several years back with kids college, and one of the young girls in the class made a comment about how it was hard for her to share her work with her parents because she did want to explore some of these darker topics. She's like, it's, it's just hard to share that with them because then they always think like, you know, they need to come fix something. She's like, I'm just exploring the topics and it's hard to get them to understand that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Have you experienced that, and how do you talk about your work? I think I've experienced it a little bit. Parents are always going to worry, and like like you said, some of these poems are very dark. It helps that I've gotten better at communicating with my parents. If they have concerns, they can always talk to me. And a lot of these poems were just me exploring that topic, or I had friends who had gone through something like that of the topic I was discussing. And some of them are about things I had experienced, you know, so it was it's kind of just an exploration of everything. And did you find that that helped you work through some of those experiences or things that you were thinking about or understanding what some of your friends went through? I would say so, definitely. It, it can be hard to put feelings into words, but I think there's something beautiful about doing that. And a lot of the times when I just start putting my feelings into words, they come out scrambled and then they come out the way I want them. It's a process. Definitely. It really is. I, I think for me, writing is very therapeutic as well. Um, Plenty of things that I start writing never make it anywhere, but it helped with whatever it was that was on my mind or that I was going through on an emotional level to get that out of my head in a semi-organized manner. <laughs> <laughs> to think it through, to put it out there in a different format that I can like, work through it a little bit more in what feels like to me like a safe space. That's a safe space to me to be able to explore some of those thoughts and feelings that I'm going through. Not so much lately, but I, I do a lot of like arts and crafts and painting and different things. And I find that helpful as well. But for me, writing is more where I find that ability to really figure out what's swirling around in my head. <laughs> I'm the same way. <laughs> I like what you said earlier about trying different things and exploring different ways to express yourself. Poetry was never that thing for me when it comes to words. I don't think very well in short form. <laughs> I'm a little more wordy than that. <laughs> but I like that approach of, you know, what's going to be the best way for an individual person to work through those thoughts and feelings. And were there other things that you tried that you explored on ways to express yourself before poetry maybe became the main focus? I write other things as well. I don't just write poetry, so that helps as well. But I do like journaling. Um, I do draw a little bit. And then a lot of times just talking it out with friends helps me a lot, which is a little ironic because I'm an introvert, but it works well for me. 
And when you find that trusted person that you feel like you can share with, I think that's really invaluable, especially in those teenage years when there's a lot going on. (laughs) It's a lot to work through. Now, I wanted to see if you would read a couple of poems. And there were a few that, that really struck me that I wanted to ask you about. And one of them was the Toxic Bubbles. Okay. And so if you wouldn't mind reading that, and then we can chat about it for a minute. Yeah. Toxic bubbles climb up, 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 as whispers of desperate crime corrupt the mind, clawing through as these toxic bubbles taint the air with the question of where, as the body battles a losing a war never again is sworn, but toxic bubbles are meant to be mourned, at last fall aimlessly and drown at home with toxic bubbles staining the foam. I really liked this one. It had a strong visual image as I was reading it. And it's interesting because the illustration paired with it wasn't what came to mind for me. But I was really interested in how you took your words and then translated that into the image that's paired with it. So if you don't mind describing the illustration and then how you went from the poem to working with on that illustration with your grandma. Sure. So this poem was originally meant to be about addiction. And of course, anyone can interpret in any way they would like. But I kind of imagined this is one of those dark poems where, in my mind, the person does overdose in the end. And so they're on that bed with the pill bottle in their hands. um, And I wanted a visual representation of the bubbles as well, because that's the name of the poem Mm -hmm. and stuff. And so I kind of just imagined that this person was kind of floating, no longer really there because the addiction had taken such a hold on them that their only thought was the next hit. And then at the end, they can no longer get another hit because they have overdosed. And so that's kind of what I had imagined and why the bed's like floating and stuff. That's really beautiful. And I I think that that does depict that really well. My approach as I was going through and reading this was that I would read the poem first without really looking too much at the illustration because I wanted to get an idea just of what brought to my mind before pairing the two together. And I thought this one was really interesting because I can definitely see where you were coming from. When I first read it, the things that came to mind, especially with the word toxic and taint, was more toxic relationships. Oh. And how that has a similar feeling to it. It can be very isolating. It can pull you out of the larger society because it's overwhelming yeah. <laughs> to be constantly influenced by people who are toxic or to have that kind of pressing in on you. And when I thought about that paired with the illustration, and it's like, okay, like you were coming at it from the idea of addiction and drawing those conclusions, I found that really interesting how many similarities there were between what came to mind for me and what you were presenting in your original idea. And so I thought that that was really nicely done with the poem itself. I really enjoyed the poem and then the illustration along with it. I think that's a beautiful interpretation. I can definitely see it. And again, that's what I really love about poetry is just how many different ways you can interpret it and that there's value for everyone. There is. So the other one that I wanted to ask you about, and then I'll have you tell me which one you would like to share, maybe one of your favorites or one that you find would be helpful for others to kind of get an idea of what you write and your style. But the other one that I really enjoyed was Liar. And I love the illustration for it as well. (laughs) (laughs) The liar in my head hums a tuneless song as he whispers sweet threats into my bones. The liar in my head sings of a haunted want as he scarcely forgets what I condone. The liar in my head shouts to an endless beyond as he weaves nets to catch his own. The liar in my head, silent as I respond, whimpers in false regrets as he's left all alone. Thank you. This illustration, it's very striking. There's a figure in the forefront, and then with this darkness kind of coming in, there's another more menacing figure that's looming over, grasping at the main figure's head. And it really 
gives a strong sense of the impact of those types of thoughts in your heads. And, and so tell me a little bit more about what this poem communicates and what you were trying to, to share with the person reading it. So this poem was originally about intrusive thoughts, um, something I have personal experience with, as I'm sure pretty much everyone does. Um, and it was also kind of about my coping skills, especially towards the end, where I combat the intrusive thoughts with more logic, because I tend to be a pretty logical person. And um, so when my intrusive thoughts come in, I can say, no, that's not true. And here are the reasons why. That's kind of what the last phrase is about. And then the liar also kind of recognizes that I am a liar as well. I lie to myself. Um, and he tries to catch me in the act and press that advantage about. And then the illustration, for me, it really showcases how it's in your head, but there's also this darkness kind of surrounding that person. And that's, that's kind of all they can see is that darkness because of these thoughts. Those type of thoughts, again, can be really overwhelming. And it's kind of that old adage of, you know, if you tell someone something often enough, they'll believe it. And that starts at such a young age for a lot of people. You know, if, if they grow up not with supportive and encouraging people in their lives, then they get into that mindset of you're bad or you, you can't do that right or you're not going to become anybody when you grow up. And that's so harmful to young people. And I think today with like social media, that can be in your face so much. <laughs> yes. It's, there's just a lot of negative messages out there in the world. And it is really hard to learn how to cope with that and to find those skills. And it's something that I think is being talked about more now. And it's more of a focus to identify when that's happening with young people and to hopefully get them you know, resources and like you said, kind of learn how to combat that. And, you know, for me, that's something I've struggled with as well. I kind of refer to them as my spiraling thoughts <laughs> when things start being like, okay, maybe that didn't go so well, or I'm, I'm struggling to keep up with this. And then they just start going round and round and round in my head. And learning how to stop that process was something that I've spent a lot of time a lot of years <laughs> working with a therapist. <laughs> yes. And like, you know, cause it was just, it wasn't something that I learned when I was younger and trying to learn that as an adult, I think it's probably harder <laughs> than starting to develop those skills when you, when you're a young person. So I really like, applaud that you think about that and that you're, you have an awareness of these are not helpful thoughts. This is not helping me progress in the way that I want to. How do I learn to deal with that and to minimize it because you really can't like completely make those types of things go away. You know, if someone who deals with anxiety or depression or, you know, mental health issues, it's hard to ever be like, Oh good. I'm fixed now. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I, I learned it. I'm done. That's never going to be a problem again. It's an ongoing thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that says a lot from someone in the peer group of teenagers today to have that message be something that you're focusing on and to share with other people and that, Hey, you know, yeah, there are ways to work with this. It doesn't have to be a completely overwhelming thing. There are resources I really appreciated that message coming through in this poem. Thank you. I'm glad it came across. <laughs> <laughs> and is there one that you would like to share that you feel like gives a good representation or helps people kind of get an idea of you and your writing? Ooh. Um, I know that's always a tough question. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like people asking you, which one's your favorite book? Yeah. Um, <laughs> they all have value for me. I think I'm going to go with one of the first poems I wrote, which is sometimes it's a long one, but <laughs> sometimes a birdie comes to talk. No one hears my little birdie. No one but me. Sometimes a black cat comes to visit. No one sees my little black cat. No one but me. Sometimes a monster lurks in my house. No one knows my monster. 
no one but me. Sometimes a distorted shadow paints skin. No one feels my distorted shadow. No one but me. Sometimes it is all too much. The birdie is calling venom dripping from its beak. Sometimes it is all too much. The black cat has multiplied, glares of ice digging into me. Sometimes it is all too much. The monster is no longer tame, and sleep is no option for me. Sometimes it is all too much. The distorted shadow is clawing, beautiful maroon dripping down. Sometimes there is no one. My little birdie has flown away, and no one sees, no one but me. Sometimes there is too little. My black cat has left, but there is no good luck for me. Sometimes energy is too far. My monster has disappeared. Sleep is all there is for me. Sometimes there is no pleasure. My distorted shadow stepped in the sun, taking beauty with it. Sometimes it is all true. They band together, tormenting me. Sometimes tomorrow is too far. Thank you. I, I really liked that one as well. Tell me a little bit about this poem. So this is the poem that really got me into poetry. And I actually wrote it for school um, in a psychology class for my final project, um, which was about bipolar. And even though I don't have bipolar, um, I still found value in writing that poem. There really is a way that like all your emotions can just overwhelm you. But there is also times where you just feel numb and, and just don't enjoy anything. Um, and I think that's true for everyone. Um, and I think that I, I tried to get that across with this poem um, and that there's times where just everything is so overwhelming and you just can't think. And, and a lot of times people are like, just hold on for one more day. Um, and for me, that's not always helpful because in that moment, tomorrow is just too far, you know, um, and I had to find ways to regulate myself and to calm myself so I could see that tomorrow is possible. That is something that I think a lot of people struggle with, I think, especially in today's world where there's just so much going on all the time, mm -hmm. so many things coming at you, whether that's through media or, you know, when you're in school, that there's a lot of demands on your time and your attention for adults and their, their professions. Like it does, it just gets to be a lot sometimes. <laughs> and it's really hard to step back from that and take that break and set it all aside long enough that you can kind of reset. And like you said, start to regulate how to get through those really stressful times so you can get back to a calmer space. Even if it's just, you know, five, 10 minutes, that's all you can get of, of yeah. the calm space <laughs> before you dive back in. I think it's still really valuable to take that time mm -hmm. and learn how to recognize those signs that, oh, it is getting to be too much. I need to step back and have that minute to just get away from it all. Yeah. Well, we are um, out of time, but I really enjoyed getting to learn a little bit more about you and your writing, Samuel. Um, tell people where they can find you online to stay up to date on what you're doing and, and what your future projects might be. So you can find me online at my website, samuelgalbraith.com. If you would like to buy the book, if you're in Farmington, um, it's available at Amy's Bookcase. My future projects, um, I'll probably still continue writing poetry, um, but I'll also be writing some prose and trying to get some novels out there. Um, I don't know how long that will take, but I'm hoping to get there. Good. Yeah, it's it's a process. It'll it'll take as much time as it takes. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've learned that. <laughs> well, thank you, Samuel, for coming on the show today. I really enjoyed our chat and uh, wish you the best of luck with your future projects. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. I had a lot of fun. Did you enjoy that podcast? We hope that you did. And if you did, share it with your friends. And if you really want to keep podcasts like this coming, please support KSJE. You can do it easily online at ksje.com.